But it's just I, the thing I like about that song is it's just slow enough. Yeah. Because it could, if you do it too fast, it would be nonsense. But it's just slow enough. It's about to be 95 beats per minute, I think, around there. No, I'm, not, I'm not sure what it is on the, sure. on the BPMs, but it's just, it's just, it's just sleazy and yeah. And it's a rough mix of a demo. Do you know what I mean? We never really recorded that for the album. Yeah. But all, all that, all that definitely maybe era songs, they all stand up because they were recorded, you know, by we were all in our twenties then. Do you know what I mean? Or Liam was. Probably about 19, do you know what I mean? So yeah. the, and all, all the sentiments of those songs still hold true today, so... It'll, 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 it'll never date that album. A certain amount of uh, the naivety as well, as you, as you point out, being young and kind of getting the excitement of going in a studio and having those songs and not worrying about overproducing and not worrying about record sales, all that kind of stuff. It can only happen once in your life, can't it, really, as a band? Yeah, because the second the second time around we were doing Morning Glory, although the approach was even more haphazard, it took less time. Mm. Um, um, but we knew what our audience was then, if you like. With Goldie as well. Will you be working with? Um... You won't be working with him again. You won't. Why? <laughs> he's a nightmare. He's a nightmare. In what? What respect? I can't understand a word he's saying, and he's he's from Wolverhampton. But he'll like this when he sees this man. He's, he's a neighbour of mine as well. Actually, I'm supposed to be doing some stuff for a film with him, but he's not he's not showing me the money yet. And as soon as he shows me the money, then I'll do the track. <laughs> really? So any other collaborations with any dance musicians? Uh, not at the moment, no. Not at the moment. No. And any plans with yourself as Oasis? We're just writing at the moment, and uh, here's another one. Look at him. He's Goldie's manager. I mean, look at the state of him. <laughs> look, 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 look. Have they you? Look, look, he's the one who won't get the fucking checkbook out. <laughs> Too busy doing demos for Oasis at the moment. And how's that all going? It's going pretty slowly, but it's going all right. It's just sounding all right, anyway. Because Liam wants to get back out there and sing, doesn't he? You'll have to wait, won't you? So how much has dance music influenced the music you're making? I used to be a bit of a club in my time when I was a kid, you know. In the case of the Stone Roses, that was why we started the group. Because um, we were into the Jam and the Smiths before that. But the Smiths with Morrissey and the Quiffs and all that, we, we, we thought back in the day that you had to be, you either had to go to college or be an art student to be in a band. Or be Paul Weller. So, um, and when we when we first when I first go and see the roses, they dressed just like the same. This is before all the flares and all that. Nobody was cool in those days, and we all we all wore drainpipe trousers and all that. But they looked exactly the same as we did. And um, and on about eight. I have to say, in this day and age, it's very easy, particularly in the game that I'm in, the guitar music, or whatever you want to call it, to write angst and you know because the world is, is is not in the best shape i think with a song like holy mountain for instance which is just full of joy and it's almost revolutionary these mm. days because um rock music or whatever you want to call it it seems to be a lot of shouting about some unspecified injustice that's going on with these like dave grohl for instance what's he all about <laughs> what's he shouting about nothing does <laughs> he's he? not shouting about anything what's he shouting about and um green day what are they on about <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like rock has killed rock and roll almost. Virgin Breakfast with Sam and Amy. Was it a complication that either of you could have sung those songs? No, I couldn't sing them. Right. I wasn't interested. Mm. I started to sing by default because Liam, you know, was a bit erratic in his timekeeping sometimes. I'll put it like that nicely, you know. And uh, I sing the odd B-side and... And and I I gradually grew into it, and then gradually began to love it, you know. Um, and then towards the end of Oasis, round about, you know, uh, 2005 time, became good at it. I, I it took me a long time, but I found my voice. Do you know what I mean? And um, it wasn't something that came naturally to me, or it wasn't an obsession with mine. It was just I did it because, you know, Liam needed a break. For some reason, in, in, you know, halfway through the gig. But I do like it. Yeah. The tube is a great leveller because there's no there's no first class on it, so you're yeah. on it together. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I've been asked a few times, is this to stop for Madame Two Swords and all that kind of thing? <laughs> and uh, but you know, it's just it's, it's, it's the most are practical way of getting around. London. No question, no question. Yeah. When when you're with High Flying, when you moved to High Flying Birds post Oasis, how did you how did you manage that in your head? Because I always think of like Wurzel Gomez. Do you remember Wurzel Gomez? Mm. The head, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oasis head and high flying bird's head. Is that what you did? Or? Well, I gave, I gave my. So 
I left in 2009. I didn't put a record out till 2012. Mm. So I gave myself... When I, when I left, my manager said, what are you going to do? And I was... The only thing that I knew what I was going to do was do nothing. I was just going to just take a bit of time out. And um, then my missus got pregnant and I was like, right, I'm definitely going back to work now then. <laughs> And music was an escape for me. It was kind of, you know, you know that three minutes was, would take you somewhere else out of the drudgery of cold northern England in November. You, know. you say it's just like any, anyone else, but you, your dad is depicted as quite a scary character. Yeah, I wouldn't say, yeah, I wouldn't say he was a monster. I would just say he was a shit dad. And violent? Yeah, prone to it, yeah, yeah. And that, you suffered that? I mean, yeah. That, yeah, yeah. But you must be affected by that, because that's uh, not normal, is it? Well, I've never sat down on a couch with a psychiatrist until now. And uh, I don't know. I've never written a song about my childhood, about, about um, any of that. And I wouldn't, really, I wouldn't really feel comfortable doing it, you know. I don't mind talking about it, because I'm, I'm all right with it. I dare say that most of the kids on my street, their upbringing was quite the same. People were seeing End of the Band when you started talking about solo album. I was in a, an interview in Europe and the guy was saying, so, you know, blah, 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 so have you ever considered a solo album? And I said, well, you know, um, these four songs I probably won't use for Oasis, but I might use them a solo album in the future. So anyway, so Liam goes and does an interview afterwards with this same guy and he's coming back in and, and I could see it in his eyes that he was absolutely disgusted and offended that I would even consider a solo album. So I thought, all right, well, this is going to be fun for the next six weeks. So every interview that I'd done, I was like, well, I'm playing a solo career. You know, I've, written, I've written four songs for a solo album, only two for an Oasis album. So this kept getting back to him. And the more he kept getting annoyed about it, the more I would say it. But for the record, I'm not doing a solo album. I never intended to do a solo album. Uh, it's just all for the benefit of uh, family relations. <laughs> We're brothers, man, and we, he's the singer in my band and I'm his songwriter. And, you know, there's, there's something between us that will never be broken, you know, by some guy who sits with, with a typewriter. The News of the World, a, a late newspaper, they, they tried to put you in contact with him, didn't they? They brought him to a hotel. Yeah, yeah. Quite a tricky evening. Yeah. <laughs> Liam overreacted and went absolutely mental. And uh, I was of the opinion that it was just like, just ignore them, do you know what I mean? Just ignore them. There's no point. The party was in full swing and it was a great night. And uh, all of a sudden it kind of came crashing down. But I, it's, I, don't, I don't take anything like that seriously. I think it's just water off a duck's back to me. And you, you, d you don't know where he is now? I know exactly where he is. Oh. Yeah, he's still living in the house that my mum left right. him in. Yeah, he's still there. My, he lives about a mile and a half away from where my mum moved us to. And all my mum's sisters, we all live in, we all grew up in the same place. Everybody still sees him. It's, it's a very, nobody, nobody cares anymore. It's a long time ago. You know. You're in a documentary so, next week, aren't you, about Man huh? City? Am I? Yeah, well, it says so in my TV guide. Well, I gonna, really? I was going to ask you what it's about, but obviously I know more about it than you. <laughs> well, it's about Man City then, isn't it? <laughs> I haven't got a clue, mate. My, my, my manager said so, I was still asking. All right, everyone from Oh, well, I know, I'd tell you what it was, yeah, I remember, that's right, I remember getting filmed for it. <laughs> yeah. It was at the uh, City Portsmouth game, the opening game of the season, I think. It was a documentary about Mancunians. Mm. Should, be, should be highly exciting, eh? <laughs> 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 I've seen him, we still... He still had his own firm of laying concrete floors and we still did a bit of work with him. But then very soon after that, we, you know, we kind of became men. And then you go off and do your own thing. It's not, um... It's not shocking for families to become estranged when, physically, family of boys, when they all get them and start doing their own thing. Did you and Paul have a stammer? I did. I think Paul, yeah. I think Paul did. We used to go to speech therapy. And you got over the stammer? Eventually. Eventually. The high flying birds. Fun. Okay. All right. More fun than when you were in Oasis? Definitely more fun than it towards the end of Oasis, that's for sure. Yeah, How long have you been in High Flying, High Flying Birds? Birds now 14 years, I think. It's never 14 it's years. 14 wow. years, yeah, yeah. I think, Is uh, that the longest you've been in a band? <laughs> How long was Oasis? 18. Oh, right, OK. Yeah, uh, eight, yeah 18, 19. I think it's like... 14? Yeah, yeah, 13, 14. Well, yeah, started in 2011. It's, what, 2024 almost? 20, yeah, yeah. Yeah.
Wow. I have read you speaking about um, what's the story Morning Glory and saying it's a shame because it would have been great in 2015, the anniversary of that album coming out, it would have been great to maybe, maybe go out and play that whole album for yourself and for the fans. Uh, and now I, I hear that Liam has come out, he's read those comments, and he said, you know what, I wouldn't be averse to that. Yeah. <laughs> See, I don't believe he said that. He said it. It's no, him. no, no, I know him better than you do. <laughs> he said it just so you could bring it up tonight on this show, <laughs> on national television. Well, which He's I a very, 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 very clever man. Huh? <laughs> Maybe you didn't say that to him often enough. <laughs> no, that's true. No, 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 no. No. I he tweeted it as well. He's on Twitter, hasn't he? Aren't you all? The bit on the end of the bag, up, you know, the explosion. That's uh, plastic explosives that are recorded from 100 metres, right? And this CD has them recorded from a distance going right up, so it's just like... <laughs> I would use sound effect CDs on everything. Seriously. He was playing back the next and put the explosion in before Gem had heard it, and he, was <laughs> and he went, Ooh, fucking hell. Not sure about that. That's an explosion, man. That's the start of the album. That's pyrotechnics. Well, I don't know about the fucking explosion. I was like, oh, right, yeah, but the gong's all right, innit? Because it's quite an odd tune, that. It's not like anything I've ever written before, and the bass drops in and out, and it's very strange chords, and it's a bit Pink Floyd, and once that finishes, the rest of the album just really flows. Old Gallagher arrived at Heathrow tonight amid speculation that abruptly abandoning Oasis American tour two-thirds through was a prelude to break up. He wouldn't answer questions about the future. Is it the end for Oasis? It just seems to be a never-ending circle of work. And, of course, everyone was, you know, trying to squeeze as much life out of morning glory as possible before the band imploded. Yeah, we've, I think, three years without any sort of break of more than a week, ten days. And that was constantly touring or recording. I had just about enough, and I said, if this is what it is, you know, then I'm not going to be in a band. Dead article <laughs> in my bathroom, man, I read it about three days ago. Yeah. So I was like, any idea the chat, chat listing? No? Song, but yeah, fine. You know, put, put Songbird on. Yeah. Yeah, right, as long as uh, I get yeah. my points, I'm all right. Yeah, that's that same as Songbird on it, yeah, I'll yeah. see you in the bar. Yeah. So um, it, wasn't, it wasn't really... A, Democratic choice. That seems to be so. so you, you're obviously evolving from album to album, and now with this new one, is it going to be closer to the first record? Do yeah. you think? Well, we're producing this ourselves, and we produced the first one ourselves, so mm. that would be the main similarity. Uh, it's just a very up rock and roll record. It's very, it's classic Oasis. It's not, you know, it's not rocket science or anything mm. like that. It's not. You know, we're not gonna. We're not going to be winning any awards for cutting edge music, you know. But the songs that you know, we know, we we try to write the best songs that we can and record them in the way that we like, and we like traditional sounds, really, you know. But um, I think you'll be presently surprised. Come back to school. You managed to pull a good trick in my book that you were mitching from school in a school where your mother was the dinner lady. <laughs> now that's a, a, a fairly neat accomplishment, if I may say so. Yeah, well, it's one of my greatest achievements, I have to say. Eventually, one of the teachers, I think, said they'd asked my mum, well, you know, actually murdered me and stuck me in a cupboard or something because they hadn't seen me for months. And my mum was like, well, I've seen him every day. Wait a minute, are you saying you went in every day so that she yeah. would see you at lunchtime? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, went in to, I went in to have my dinner every day. It was a bit of an art to get in and then get out in a 45-minute period without being seen by any of the teachers you were having lessons with that next afternoon or you were supposed to have had lessons with that morning. Man, you've written some great songs. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but before we talk about what you're doing now and all that, I read this in the papers this week. I want to check if it's true. Simon Cowell phoned you up, offered you the job yeah. uh, as be to be one of the X Factor judges in this current series. Yes, he did, to replace him. Yeah. What a, what a, I imagine, an unexpected phone call to receive? Yeah, well, because he's something to do with Sony Records and I've got friends there and somebody phoned me and said, Simon Cowell's after your number, shall I give it to him? And I said, OK, all right, whatever. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, did you think what he might have wanted it for? What did you um, think he wanted it for? I thought initially he might have wanted a song yeah, of oh, some yeah. description, which is what I do, you know, yeah. and, I, and I was like, you know, all right. OK. And, uh, <laughs> and then I thought, 
um, he might want us to sit in on, you know, like they do those where they have a guest thing for one show, in, oh, like yeah. in Manchester or something. So and I they're going to cover the music that you wrote, maybe. I'll do that. Way. I'll just put a lot of fat people through or something like okay. that. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, that's, that's good of you. That's good of you. Yeah. The last question. The Rolling Stones, the Beatles, they had Chuck Berry and Little Richard. How much did you listen to Little Richard and Chuck Berry? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, Little Richard and Chuck Berry go straight through to Steve Jones from the Sex Pistols. You know, I don't know. It's all just the blues in it at the end of the day, but you know, and it all goes back, all goes back to to Mississippi in some way, doesn't it? You know, if it wasn't for, well, if it wasn't, for, you know, for black geezers playing guitars, they invented rock and roll, didn't they? Because it, you know, because Elvis Presley sold it to the white kids, you know, who then sold it back to the American white kids. We then bought shitloads of it. And then, you know, then we came along. And we're still buying it. From what I can remember, there was there was like a ledge there where all the dads used to come with the sons, plunk them on the ledge and then go on the piss down the bar here. <laughs> and then just leave the sons there. <laughs> <laughs> so we used to go to away matches regularly, didn't we? Yeah, all of them. In the mid-80s. Yeah. I think there was one season where we went, I think we went to every single game of first uh, Still quite proud of that. Something like 50 odd games. There's about 20 of us. You're probably watching this after you're like Owsy and Tatey and all them. Yeah. How are you doing anyway? <laughs> if I wasn't doing what I was doing now, I'd probably probably be. Well, I wouldn't say I'd be a footballer, but I'd probably have, have hopes of being a footballer. You know, for the net, it's a good indicator of where. Well, because we had so much time off, we were just putting our foot back in the water, you know. And I was exploring a few things in the studio and a few things lyrically and a few things within myself. You know, and during the making of the record, we found out that we were good at some things and not so good at others. We found out that we're not techno boffins. We found out that we're a fucking, we're a dirty rock and roll band and that's what we should remain. We found out that we're no good at, uh, at anticipating what modern thinking people like about rock and roll music. We found out that we're good at just plugging the guitar into an amp, turning the fucking thing up. As long as the song's good, that'll carry it through. Spice Girls, you know, with Liam sort of thing, and you were at the British uh, Wards that night. Mm. What do you think of the Spice Girls? I, I like them as characters. Mm. I think it was it Sporty Spice. It's got good voice, man, I tell you, mm. for a white chick. Uh, but I don't, I'm not into all this, you know. They're just a big money, money-making corporate machine, aren't they? Mm. You know, advertising crisps and cans of Coke and all that nonsense. Mm. They've got a single out now that you can only buy if you buy 20 cans of Pepsi. You know what I mean? Mm. Not into that. But no, good luck to them, you know, the young girls. Or are they as young as they say? That's what I want to know. I'll tell you this, right? If Jerry Spice is 24, then she's going to look f***ing rough when she's 30. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you get to a certain point in your life. What was I? I was 42 at the time and still really... You know, if, you, if, you, if, if you're in a job that make, that's making you unhappy at that stage in your life, you just got to think, well, you know... There's no point. And then, then Gwigsy got, got taken, Ella, and then, then we had to cancel a load of gigs, and then we got a standing bass player in, and then he quit. <laughs> and then it was like, it was going... Oh. When I was told, it was like on the bus, and for about the first minute, we all sort of went... <sighs> and then I just broke into a fit of hysterics. I couldn't believe it. And everyone's going, what are you laughing at? And I was going, you know, I mean, how mad is this group? It's like... You know, you know, can we ever do anything just like low key? Can't we just like turn up and do gigs and then for everyone go? Yeah, for it to be easy. And then everyone just started laughing. I went, you know, I was going, well, I will have to get a new bass player. And everyone's all laughing, saying, there's so many people who have applied, there's bound to be CID there out somewhere to stick a plant in the group, man. Do you know what I mean? And over all get nicked, you know. So he's going. So when we got back, luckily enough, we, uh, we phoned up Griggs and said, um, are you up for it or what? And he went, oh, yeah. What a colossal achievement. Even as a person, we mm. me, me and Liam have achieved because the the other lads, bless them, are all kind of they don't do much. Do you know mm. what I mean? Mm. Were you frowned upon as because a, a lot of kids watch this? Well, a few kids watch this show, <laughs> and you know, I mean, a lot of them probably find themselves looking for for, for, for things to inspire them and to get them out of an everyday predicament of being a bored ass teenager. And a lot a lot of cases, people frown upon it when you have any ambition, don't they? You know? I'll tell you a true story, right? <coughs> I, I kind of I mm. used to stay in. I remember staying in constantly for a couple of years playing just. 
playing the guitar, being ob obsessing about it. And my mum, bless her, saying, you know, you're kind of 19, you know, and you kind of sit in your bedroom all night with this guitar and you don't have a girlfriend. There's anything you want to tell me? And I'm like, <laughs> are you insinuating that I'm gay, mother? You know, and she's going, well, yeah. Well, because I play an you instrument. Don't, yeah. And that Liam thought I was weird. <laughs> Weirdo. You're up there with his guitar. This is, um... Your brother Paul writing about he was a child in Manchester in the, the 1970s. <laughs> Noel was a likeable, if quietish kid, friendly to the last, nice but prone it? to bouts of moodiness, a trait he's carried on through to adulthood. <laughs> Do you recognise that? <laughs> it's nice to know that one is likeable. <laughs> yeah, a likeable chap. Um, people do say I'm moody. Yeah, I, I, I don't know where that... You know, I, I, I do frown a lot. I don't like smiling. I don't know why. I've not got a nice smile. I don't know. I don't know. I can get... I can be moody, yeah. I put it down to being a Gemini. The, I mean, I love it, you know what I mean? I do love it, but it gets me down sometimes. And I'm not one of them people who will just sit and sulk and, you know, phone up my manager and say, Liam's out of control again, or this isn't right, and that's not right, and I'm going to sit at the back of the tour bus and sulk about it. Things aren't right, you know, I'll get me going, I'll go on. Mm. You know, until it's sorted out, and then when it's sorted out, I'll come back. And it's simple as that. And I suppose it is petulant, and it's... It can be quite childish in a way, but, you know, I'm a rock star. You know, I'm paid to be childish. I heard you say